Okay, um, hello and welcome everyone to the fifth lecture on loop quantum gravity. It is the last lecture by Hal Haggard, and it is also the last lecture before the summer break of the Basics of Quantum Gravity School. Um, the Basics of Quantum Gravity School will reconvene in September with lectures on string theory and ABS on CFT and geometry, as well as asymptotic safety. So, um, yeah, maybe um, we should. Yeah. Welcome, okay, everyone. Okay. So today, um, Hal is going to finish a discussion on loop quantum gravity. He'll talk about frontiers of quantum gravity. We've switched to Zoom for today, not to the webinar version. And uh, if you have questions, you can type them in a the chat. Hal may not answer them right away, but he will take a break in between and look at them. And also, um, you can raise your hand when we have so that you can ask um, questions and also there will be end um, there will be uh, time for questions at the end of the lecture so with that um, Hal thank you once again and please feel free to start when you're ready thank you Johanna thank you everyone for being here I, I think of this as the hardcore crew because you made it all the way to the last one um, as uh, Johanna said uh, we're on the 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 zoom meeting format this time so if you like I, I'll keep the the video panel open and you can uh, show me video of yourself and when you frown i'll stop and try to ask what's going on and things like that um, but uh, if you see me messing around with the mouse a little more than often it's because i'm moving the video panel around so uh, i called this frontiers of quantum gravity but I, there's really two main things i want to talk about which are experiments and uh, and sort of places where I see particular challenges in loop quantum gravity, and I want to kind of offer you some open questions. I know many of you are students of quantum gravity and are interested in research projects, and these are some of the places where I'm thinking actively and and where you might want to think about um, solutions. Uh, but before we get there, I'll do the the thing I've been doing, which is just to refresh your memories as to what we did last week. Uh, so my first review question for you is, what is the kinematical Hilbert space that loop quantum gravity is built on? That's one of the things we covered last week. And the answer is that it's uh, it can be thought of as uh, closely analogous to the Hilbert space of uh, lattice gauge theory. Uh, if you fix a graph, we've been calling it capital gamma, and uh, you look at that, that fixed graph, the Hilbert space associated to it, it's a square integrable functions on that space where you have uh, an element uh, holonomy associated with uh, every link of the graph and gauge invariance imposed at every node of the graph. So this division here is modding out by the gauge invariance at the nodes and where you use for the integration the Haar measure on the group, which for us has been SU2. Um, this uh, modding out by the group means we want to think about gauge invariant functionals of our connection, and so we think about uh, only gauge invariant functions here. And we also discussed the fact that uh, if you want to refine uh, this Hilbert space and think about more degrees of freedom, then you can do cylindrical embedding. So you embed the get graph in a larger graph and, uh, and build up more and more degrees of freedom from there. We also talked about the fact that you can uh, make an interpolation of which these degrees of freedom are, that it was just one choice of interpolation. It's like using uh, different interpolations of signals and signal processing, and that I've been telling you about the polyhedral uh, interpolation, where we think of capturing the degrees of freedom associated with convex polyhedra at each node but that I, I don't want you to get stuck on that as the only way of thinking about these. You can think of other uh, interpolations that are interesting. So uh, that was the Hilbert space structure we discussed. Uh, we also talked about uh, the, the cat's paw print. We've been talking about the tetrahedron as an analog of the cat. It's a gauge, sim uh, gauge system built on a finite number of degrees of freedom. And the thing that we noticed about that uh, system was that if you work with the gauge invariant areas associated with each face of a tetrahedron, that's not enough variables to completely specify the tetrahedron. And you might want to work with two other shape parameters, for example, the dot products between two of these vectors. And we noticed that those dot products do not commute. In fact, their lack of uh, commuting is uh, proportional to the volume of the tetrahedron, 
where the proportionality factor is this uh, barbero Emirzi parameter we discussed, and where the sign depends on whether it's a Lorentzian or a Euclidean tetrahedron. And we noticed that this kind of has this paw print. The reason I was calling it a paw print was that it shows up all over loop quantum gravity and that it's important to kind of understand this feature and where it comes from. So one of the places that we saw it showing up was in uh, the, the discrete path integral, discrete geometry path integral, which we call a spin foam. And here I took a tack that is less common in the literature. Uh, I introduced you to what's called area regi calculus, uh, where you use the areas of faces instead of the lengths of, of edges to describe the geometry of, the, of your simplicial decomposition of a space time. The advantage of working in those variables was that the area is naturally conjugate to this curvature angle around the bone of the simplicial decomposition. And of course, the use of area variables, as I was stressing from the beginning of the course, is very harmonious with loop quantum gravity and with this Hilbert space that we've been discussing. Um, but the one scary feature of area regi calculus is that the classical equations of motion impose flatness, and you might start to worry that loop quantum gravity would only have flat solutions instead of the curved solutions of general relativity. And we realized that the way to get around that is that you, you have to impose the constraints weakly if you're going to work in these area variables. And I showed you that in, in that case, you can build an effective spin foam and actually do numerical computations where you see dynamics coming out of, of loop quantum gravity in these area variables. So that's kind of where we've been uh, in the last week or so. And uh, let me tell you about where we're going. I want to, as I mentioned already, discuss uh, prospects and challenges in connecting quantum gravity to experiment and, and touch on some new ideas. Again, as I've been doing, I'll, I'll kind of give you a preview of the sorts of things I'm going to talk about, and then I'll tell you um, some specifics uh, in much more detail. So the frame I want to give to this is this uh, challenge that we've seen again and again. So you, you can look up a table like this on Wikipedia. It just gives all the Planck units uh, for various quantities. Um, and you can look at the Planck length all the way through the Planck power. I've just selected a section of these. Uh, Planck initially worked with just the first four. And you can see they're giving fundamental units. And then you can build up other quantities out of those fundamental units. Uh, they're often called derived quantities when you get to these ones. Um, but I've been arguing to you that I think actually I, I'm a little skeptical of thinking of the Planck length as being fundamental. Uh, we talked about the fact that this square root introduces a non-analyticity that I find a little surprising to be a fundamental quantity. And it looks to me like loop quantum gravity is centering on the Planck area instead of the Planck length. And you should think of lengths as emergent in some ways. But we saw that whether you focus on lengths or areas, either way, the scales are totally crazy. <laughs> 10 to the minus 35 or 10 to the minus 70 uh, meters squared in the second case. Um, so, so the Planck scale is just a very hard scale to access experimentally. And this table presents the challenge quite clearly. Um, nonetheless, I want to draw uh, your attention to two features on this table that are interesting. Uh, the Planck mass is somehow not as overwhelming as some of these other scales. Um, the, you might also be hopeful about Planck energy, but uh, if you look at what our colliders are doing, you know, TeV scale, well, we always quote the scale of LHC in electron volts, but an electron volt is tiny compared to a joule. So even though this number looks maybe more reasonable, uh, unfortunately, it's in joules, which is a large scale. So the Planck energy is actually quite hard to get to. But the Planck mass is a very interesting uh, scale. <clears throat> the Planck mass, if, if we quote it in grams, uh, I guess we take away three orders of magnitude. So you could think of this as 21 micrograms. So 21 micrograms, that's actually a, a mass scale at which people are starting to be able to do things uh, in a quantum mechanical fashion. That is, people are starting to be able to get masses of that scale 
uh, to act coherently quantum mechanically. And so that's starting to become a very interesting scale. I, I, when I say starting, I'm, I, that we're talking several orders of magnitude. We're not quite at this Planck mass, but, uh, but we're much closer than some of these other scales. So, uh, so that's an interesting place to look for experimental signatures. Um, I've also highlighted the Planck power, which uh, on the face of it looks like an absurd scale. And if I was just arguing that we can't reach the Planck energy, why on earth would we be able to reach the Planck power? Well, the reason I'm mentioning it is that it's interesting in two ways. One is that it doesn't involve h-bar. Uh, so you can see that's coming from uh, the force not involving h-bar. And then we're just dividing by a time scale, but a time scale is, well, it's a length times a time scale and so, um, so we're getting something that doesn't involve h bar. Uh, and so, this is interesting because astrophysically we're starting to get there because of black hole collisions. The fact that gravitational waves have opened up the ex experimental investigation of black hole collisions has meant that, well, if you look at their data, there's a remarkable thing. These black holes are going at, uh, at speeds very close to the speed of light. I mean, substantial uh, fractions of the speed of light, half and, and closer to speed of light. And uh, they're macroscopic, massive objects, uh, 30 solar masses and up. And when they collide with each other, the amount of power released in gravitational waves is actually quite huge. And if you check, it's getting quite close to the Planck power. So, um, so it's an advantage of our astrophysical environment and of the incredible work that the LIGO scientific collaboration has done uh, that we can actually start to look at this scale and think about it. So the two experiments I'm going to focus most on today are, are these two, with really putting emphasis on the black hole one. Um, the only reason for that emphasis is, again, that uh, it's something I've worked on. I, I can tell you interesting things about it. So it's just a biased uh, uh, presentation of my own knowledge. Uh, but I want to uh, I want to emphasize that there's there's a beginning here that we can actually start to think about these in interesting ways. Okay. So the the first one, which I'll spend much less time on, but is maybe uh, the most interesting for talking about quantum gravity, is what people are calling gravity induced entanglement, and uh, I'll just give you a very simple presentation of this. Uh, but the idea is to take two systems, we'll call them system one and system two, each made up of two masses, equal masses, and to put those systems into a superposition of positions. So in the first system, uh, we'll put it into a left and right superposition, and in the second, we'll put it into a left and right uh, superposition. Uh, sorry, I may have misspoken there. I made it sound like there's four masses, but it's just a superposition of uh, mass over here. And you can see that when we expand that uh, tensor product, it's, a, it's just a standard unentangled state initially. But when we expand it, we get four branches. And in those four branches, there's uh, one pair that is brought closer together by the superposition. And uh, we could arrange things experimentally so that these are brought uh, the closest of any of the, the branches. So that's the, the, the basic setup. Here uh, in the picture, I'm showing that you could also put a conducting plate. This would be to try and shield uh, electromagnetic interactions. And what they're doing is starting to take advantage of the universal nature of gravity, the fact that these will interact no matter what kind of shielding you try to put in. So, uh, so what they're going to try and do is isolate the gravitational effect as, as carefully as possible. And then the idea is that in that one branch where the masses are close to each other, say distance d, and say this experiment lasts for a time t, in that branch you're going to get a gravitational time dilation effect that's really concentrated on these masses. 
And because of that, their, their phase will evolve. It'll be an e to the minus uh, i h t over h bar sort of interaction term that's going to cause the, the masses in this branch to evolve phase. And if the, the total interaction time is t, then the, the change in phase with respect to the rest of the system is this uh, down here, Newton's constant times mass squared t over h bar d. The amazing thing about this result is that it's um, it's probing the Newtonian limit of the gravitational field. So in that sense, it's a non-relativistic effect uh, that's really taking advantage of the fact that we can put masses that are getting close to the Planck mass into superpositions, into quantum states. And so if you look at the details here, uh, we're about a couple of, order mag of orders of magnitude away from being able to make this phase significant, you know, of order pi phase shift, so that when you recombine the system at the end of the experiment, you could see substantial phase interactions, substantial interference. And as such, you would be able to conclude that, uh, that the systems have become entangled. So that's incredible because it's an entanglement that's due to the dynamics of gravity. Okay, I admit that it's a Newtonian limit, but you couldn't do this unless the gravitational field were uh, mediating this interaction. And this would be very concrete evidence that this entanglement was due to quantum gravity. You can't, there, there's a result in quantum information theory that you can't entangle quantum systems unless you have a quantum system uh, interacting that's causing the interaction between them. So uh, this is as much as I'm going to say about this uh, idea, but it's an extremely active field right now. It's something that we should all be uh, keeping tabs on to see whether this can be reached. And the folks who do these sorts of experiments uh, in quantum optics labs and things like that uh, are quite optimistic that this is going to be achievable. So this would be concrete evidence that the gravitational field truly is quantum mechanical. Um, if you like, in the question period, we can discuss a little bit. There, there are some challenges to that idea, uh, but I actually think that uh, they're quite hard to, uh, to defend. <laughs> so if this was a measured effect, uh, I think it would be uh, quite clear that, that you needed quantum gravity albeit only, uh, only evidence in the Newtonian limit. But so that's going to be common to all of the theories of quantum gravity. This is not going to pick out uh, one approach over another as being special. This is a low energy limit of the theory, but it's still saying that we're really on the right track looking for a quantum theory here. So this is an exciting idea. Um, the second system I want to bring your attention to, I already mentioned, was black holes. And here you know the, the wonderful uh, result, which again seems to be quite robust to the Euro approach, is the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. And uh, I, usually we suppress all the units in this for, for obvious reasons, but I put all the units back in because of an, a remarkable thing that my colleague Eugenio Bianchi likes to point out, which is that this black hole entropy involves every area of physics. <laughs> You see that it's got uh, special relativity in the C, it's got the Newton constant G, it's got H bar quantum effect, it's got K, this is K Boltzmann, the thermodynamic uh, quantity, and it's got geometry in so far as the entropy is determined by the horizon area of the black hole. Uh, here, M is the, the mass of the black hole and J is its uh, angular momentum. So this is an incredible formula that can kind of brings together all of these branches of physics. And, uh, and in, in doing that, I think it actually opens up a really interesting possibility for trying to probe quantum gravity. Um, I mentioned this last week, but uh, I think that one of the places to really look for an experimental signature of quantum gravity is in gravitational uh, general relativistic statistical mechanics. Um, the reason for that is that the statistical nature of systems can enhance the uh, quite small effects, Planckian effects of quantum gravity. And so that enhancement is going to be the way the leverage bar 
to bring the scale of the phenomena to something that we can measure. Uh, that's the idea anyway. And, uh, and so I'm going to try and give you more evidence for that idea and, and sort of build that idea out in the example of black holes. So to, to frame the question that I want to ask you, uh, I want to, we, we say two kind of contradictory things when we talk about black holes. If you study black holes in the classical theory, we say that somehow they're the simplest objects in all of nature. <laughs> A black hole is completely characterized in the in the classical theory by its mass and its spin, right? If you specify those two parameters, you've specified a solution of the classical theory, and it's just perfectly well defined. On the other hand, we have this Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, which uh, the black hole has a macroscopic horizon area, and yet we're measuring that area in units of the Planck area. And so this entropy is just gigantic. It's huge. And so a huge entropy, well, we usually associate a huge entropy with a very complex system that has many, many degrees of freedom inside of it. And so it would seem that we're talking about a wildly complicated system. And so the question is, which of these pictures is correct? Uh, the quantum picture seems to be this latter picture. And the struggle in quantum gravity is to uh, precisely identify this huge number of degrees of freedom. And so the, the work I want to talk to you about today is an attempt to look for an experimental signature of this uh, Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. All right. So the, the plan today is to focus in on that as just one approach to looking at experiments in quantum gravity. As I say, uh, I think that looking at general relativistic statistical mechanics is maybe the most promising place to look for experiment, but I'm also telling you about this work because it's something that I know well. And so don't, don't be biased by my one idea here. Uh, we need many more such approaches to experimental quantum gravity. Uh, in the last two sections, which will be much shorter, again, I have too much to cover in our brief time, uh, but in the last two sections, I just want to introduce you to uh, some open problems. So I want to mention again uh, the presence of matter in quantum gravity and the presence of the cosmological constant, uh, and you can phrase this in a kind of fun way as looking for massive and curved cats. Um, and then in the last section, I want to sort of point out, a, again, a parallel with quantum field theory, where we kind of understand that the one of the major shifts in thinking is going from systems that have a fixed number of particles to systems that have variable number of particles. Well, what would that mean in a space time? And one analogy is that, well, maybe it's about topology changing, that you could have space times that sort of have uh, no branching in them, and then shifting to space times that have branching in them. And I think it's very much an open question whether that's a necessary part of quantum gravity or not, and what role it plays. And, and so I want to kind of show you that, that question a little bit more concretely and, and pose it to you. <laughs> All right, so let me tell you first about this uh, experimental idea, and, and we'll build from there. All right. The main thing I want to start off by framing this with is that uh, gravitational thermodynamics and statistical mechanics are quite atypical. Uh, this is uh, maybe something you've noticed, maybe not, maybe it made you uncomfortable, but you never quite put a finger on what's weird about them. Uh, the, there are kind of three key points I can make right off the bat. Gravity is long range, we knew that. But even uh, more troublesome, it can't be shielded. There's no way to isolate a system and cut out the gravitational effects. Um, we've talked a lot about the fact that there's no Hamiltonian in quantum gravity. We were noticing that you can't build an energy. And we made a, a general covariance argument for that. But this is another symptom of that, the fact that you can't shield the system, you can't isolate it. That's related to the fact that it's always interacting. Um, another feature is that uh, strongly gravitating systems do not have additive energies. When you uh, take uh, two black holes and you begin to let them orbit each other, the, the 
energy of the total system is not just the sum of the mass of the first black hole with the mass of the second black hole. There's a binding energy. And that binding energy is totally non-negligible. It's a significant part of the energy of the system. And this is the non-linearity of the theory. And what I want to point out to you is that both of these facts undermine uh, the basic notion of extensivity uh, in the usual formalism of thermodynamics. So extensivity has to do with when we put two systems together, what happens? So for example, if uh, we're studying an ideal gas and we have one cylinder of gas and a second cylinder of gas and we put the two together, well, then the volume of the combined system is just the sum of the volumes. And the energy of the combined system is just the sum of the energies. Those are extensive quantities and uh, they play a really key role in thermodynamics. There's also what we call intensive quantities like temperature, which when I combine the two ideal gases, the temperature of the total system is exactly what it was if the two systems started with the same temperature. So um, those are intensive quantities. But if you look into the theory a little, you'll see that intensive quantities are derived from extensive quantities. They're usually ratios of two extensive quantities. In the case of temperature, you could think of the definition as the deri energy derivative of entropy. So entropy and energy are each extensive. The ratio is, is intensive, and that's how we're getting at the temperature. So uh, thermodynamics is strongly built on these pillars of extensivity and intensivity. And so the fact that gravity violates this means that uh, it's totally non-trivial to figure out uh, what a gravitational thermodynamics and statistical mechanics should be like. But I've been arguing it somehow should be the best <laughs> leverage point for looking at experiments in quantum gravity. So we have to start to think about how are we going to get at this. Uh, let me just uh, make this even more concrete. I was sort of talking big picture there in terms of the theory, but let's just talk about a self-gravitating gas. Uh, so uh, a gas of self-gravitating particles satisfies something called the Virial theorem. You probably worked this out in a textbook uh, problem at some point. When I did it the first time, I had no idea why anyone cared, <laughs> but I'm going to try and tell you why the Virial theorem is interesting. So for uh, self-gravitating particles, the relationship is that the potential energy of the particles is equal to negative twice the kinetic energy of the particles. And so what this means is that if you calculate the total energy of this gas, which is just the sum, well, because these two are related, it's just minus the kinetic energy. On the other hand, if this is a standard system where equipartition applies, and we assume some number of degrees of freedom, or I guess I'm assuming it's a monatomic gas of particles, then we know what U total is. And we can just compute du total dt and we see this interesting result, which is that the heat capacity of this gas of particles is negative. And that's a weird feature, right? You, it says that when, um, when you're adding energy into the system, the temperature is changing in the opposite direction that you, than you would expect. So how do we understand this? Well, it's by the Virial theorem. When we add energy into the gas, the gas puffs up, and that puffing up causes the particles to go around the system more slowly. In other words, it reduces the temperature, reduces their average kinetic energy. So this is a strange uh, feature of uh, gravitating systems. In particular, it made people realize that if you want to describe what's going on with the entropy of a self-gravitating system, you actually have to divide up the system into two pieces. You have to kind of talk about a, a dense core uh, and a halo of gravitating particles around that core. And you have to think about the energy exchange between the two if you want to make sense of what's going on gravitationally. So in particular, if the core is going to get denser, you can see I'm going for black holes here, the way it can get denser is only by uh, allowing energy to escape into the halo, that halo is going to get cooler and is going to absorb the energy. 
So, uh, so this is kind of a key dynamic that's happening in these gravitational systems. So we know already, and I, we talked about this a lot in the initial uh, parts of, of the course, we know that gravity has these wonderful instabilities. Here I'm kind of going through it again in a Newtonian way, that at some point if you uh, release enough pressure, right, if a star releases enough of its nuclear fuel that there's not enough pressure anymore, then you can have a runaway effect. And that runaway effect is that the, the pressure is adding to the energy of the system, the nonlinearity is contributing to collapse. And so you can actually have a black hole form. So this is an intuitive way of thinking about how black hole formation begins. But we also want to track this energy, uh, this entropy discussion we were just having. And the key here is to understand that uh, when we have this runaway process, we're increasing the entropy of this halo, but at some point the halo can become gravitationally captured. And that's how to understand why a black hole has such a huge amount of entropy. It's not that the core has a huge amount of entropy. Your intuition says that couldn't be a lot of entropy, right? Things that are getting denser, more compact, more organized, those shouldn't have a huge amount of energy. It's the fact that the black hole captures its halo, that's where the huge amount of entropy is coming from. So this was a huge breakthrough for me in my understanding of where black hole entropy originates. Um, it's in the literature, but I, it's not much talked about. Pretorius and uh, Volek and Israel have a beautiful paper on this that I highly recommend. And Wallace also is trying to sort through some of the conceptual philosophical issues here. So, uh, so be careful when people talk about uh, black hole entropy, be careful that you don't get confused about where that entropy is residing. Your intuition isn't totally wrong. It's not residing all in the core. That would be truly surprising. It's residing in this halo, and that starts to make, help us make some sense of why the, the entropy is writ on the horizon, maybe only intuitively. I'm not trying to make a mathematical claim there. But it, it's starting, it helps me to understand why, why the entropy is actually quite rich in this system. Okay, so we've already asked this question too. I'll just review it quickly. You might wonder, is collapse avoidable? You know, is the, you know, the nonlinearity I was just speaking to, is that just a consequence of overly specialized spherical models? And, and as we discussed at the very beginning of this uh, course, the answer is a definitive no. This is what Penrose showed, that the, the collapse to black hole is generic. It, it's not about special symmetry assumptions on the system. Uh, the, the system can have quite rich uh, things going on, you know, perturbations and all sorts of things. And nonetheless, it'll collapse uh, as long as some uh, fairly weak energy conditions are met. So this is, this is why it was Nobel work. It shows that this is a generic phenomenon. Okay, so how do we connect all of these ideas, this rich setting to experiment? Well, this is what the amazing work of the LIGO scientific collaboration is, is bringing uh, to the table now. So um, this is a slide showing the, the three um, sites of the collaboration that began, the measurements back in 2015, Hanford, Livingston, and Virgo in Italy, and Kagra is uh, coming online for the next observing run, I believe, and so uh, Kagra is in Japan, and there will be another in India. So this is becoming a really rich set of antennas for looking at gravitational waves distributed all over the Earth. And of course, that distribution is part of what makes um, this a powerful way to look at um, how gravitational waves propagate. Okay, I want to kind of remind you of something that you may be aware of, but you may have lost track of. Uh, I, I think a lot of the community has last, lost track of this. We did not expect the first results that came out of the, LIG the LSC. That's the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, so I don't have to keep saying everything. The LSC was expecting that their main signal was gonna be from neutron star mergers, 
and that maybe we'd see a few black hole mergers and maybe they'd be uh, in the range that, that we were expecting or used to, and maybe they wouldn't, but nobody knew much what to expect in the black hole arena. And so that, that this plot that the collaboration puts out is really nice. The purple uh, circles on it are showing the black holes that we knew about from electromagnetic signals. These are largely pulsars. So you have a black hole and a star rotating each other, and the, the black hole is accreting matter off of the star, and it sends out these bright electromagnetic signals. And these black holes, you'll notice they're mostly in the range from five to, well, just over 20 solar masses. So that's what the vertical scale here is. Horizontal scale doesn't mean anything. It's just a way to show all the separate events. And uh, so these are the black holes we knew the most about, and uh, they're, they're relatively light. Um, they're certainly above the limit where we expected to see uh, black holes form, right? There's this so-called Chandrasekhar limit, uh, below which you don't expect black holes to form via collapse. So these are in a totally reasonable range. So the thing I want to remind you about that I think we're losing track of is that nobody expected that the main mergers we would be seeing were of black holes in the range from 20 to 40 solar masses. Right? These are black holes that we didn't know were going to be there. We'd never seen black holes like it, save maybe one or two. And we certainly didn't expect them to be abundant enough that they, they would be the main signal that we saw mergers from. The, the first events in the, in the, that were detected in 2015 were all black hole mergers, not neutron star mergers. We had to wait a while to get a neutron star merger. And as the sensitivities increase, they've just seen more and more black hole merger events. So this is a remarkable thing. This is interesting, and it's data that we should all take quite seriously, that there are more black holes out there of more variety in masses than we expected. All right. So I want to tell you about black holes, thinking about them as thermodynamic objects. And so I should fix a setting. So uh, what's my setting? Well, I'm going to consider a black hole sort of contained in a region. This region, I've drawn it very simply on the slide here, but I, I, this dashed line is quite far. I want the dashed line to be, you know, asymptotically flat. So it's a quite a big box, but by putting the black hole in a box, I'm able to talk about the mass energy content of the region. So let's fix the mass energy content of the region. That's the the thermodynamic setting for us. We're going to fix M. And this is what we would usually call a microcanonical ensemble, right? If we're doing statistical mechanics of a fixed system in a closed box, energy is not coming out or going in. And so it's microcanonical. That's what, that's what the setting I want your minds in for now. OK, what's the advantage of doing that? Well, then we can think about what the entropy means. Entropy is uh, nicely computed in the microcanonical setting. And, uh, and I want to point out a feature of the uh, Bekenstein-Hawking entropy that you may have noticed, or again, may, maybe you haven't thought much about the, uh, that formula in the context of a spinning black hole. So uh, when we talk about spinning black holes, we introduce a parameter. Uh, it's just a classical parameter of GR which we call the Kerr parameter, and it's usually denoted by a lowercase a. The advantage of this parameter is that it's dimensionless, and the way we build it is we just take the angular momentum of the black hole and divide by the units of angular momentum built out of the gravitational constants available. So this is the Kerr parameter, and uh, you can show that in the theory it ranges from zero spin, no angular momentum, up to one, when you get to one, uh, lots of wild and weird things happen. Uh, the, the horizon goes away and you have a naked singularity and things like that. Um, as far as I know, nobody that's in the empirical world thinks one is actually reachable. And there are several beautiful uh, kind of theorist arguments that you can't get all the way to one. So the famous um, thorn limit is, is one example of this. So we can write the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy in terms of the mass of the black hole and the Kerr parameter. And the Kerr parameter shows up in a very simple way, just as a square root of 1 minus a squared factor. Um, 
and uh, here I've uh, put things in terms of Planck masses, just so you can see how units are working. And the, the remarkable feature to see from this formula is that the entropy goes down as you increase the spin of the black hole. So the higher the spin, the less the entropy. Okay. So that's just a consequence of this Bekenstein-Hawking formula. And uh, the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, as I was mentioning, seems to be quite robust to your approach. That is, different approaches to quantum gravity are able to derive this formula. So let's see if we can look for quantum gravitational effect that's a consequence just of this entropy. All right, we said we're in a microeconomical setting, so we're fixing the energy of the system. And again, the idea of a statistical mechanics in a microcanonical ensemble is that the microstates should be equally probable. And so we can just count states, and it's a simple count. You just exponentiate the entropy. You know this the other way around, right? The entropy is the logarithm of the number of microstates. And so we can exponentiate the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. And then uh, if we want to know the total number of microstates at a fixed mass, right, that's the only parameter we're fixing, we have to integrate over angular momenta to get all of the states, right? Um, here you'll notice that there's an a squared dA factor. Uh, that actually makes good sense. The angular momentum is initially a vector, right? But we are going to go to spherical coordinates in that vector and there's like an r squared dr, right? So this measure is just coming from the nature of the thing that we're integrating over. And uh, well, what's the point of doing this calculation? The point is that you can extract a probability from it. And in particular, what we want is the probability at given mass, right? We said we were going to give the mass, at given mass of a particular angular momentum. OK, how do you do that? Well, you just put the number of states at that angular momentum over the total, right? And we just figured out what the total is. The total is just this integral. And so this ratio should give the probability of different spins in this microcanonical ensemble. And uh, so that's what the inset plot shows. It's a very interesting uh, plot. The um, these different distributions are at fixed mass of the black hole for but i'm showing different masses so if you take uh, the black hole to be super super tiny <laughs> two planck masses which you remember we said was 21 micrograms so we we're talking about 40 microgram black hole here in this purple distribution in that purple distribution you can you can see it's quite spread over different angular momenta but as you increase the mass to five Planck masses, 10 Planck masses, ooh, and an extreme 20 Planck masses, now we're talking 400 microgram black hole, the distribution is getting more and more centered on zero angular momentum. So why is this happening? Well, it's exactly that phenomenon that we were just saying. As you increase angular momentum, the entropy decreases. That is, there are far fewer states available at higher angular momentum. So for macroscopic masses, like a solar mass black hole, you should predict from this microcanonical ensemble that the spin should be spot on zero. Okay. In fact, uh, well, I did a more precise statement here at the bottom of the slide. The expectation value of the Kerr parameter at a solar mass is 10 to the minus 38. So <laughs> You're, you're really expecting very small angular momenta in this microcanonical ensemble. Okay, but we have to be careful here. How do we understand this result? I want you to distinguish two possibilities. What I'm talking about is if a black hole were formed in a sort of thermal ensemble, right? If it was formed according to statistical mechanics, then this is what you would expect for its spin. If it was formed via gravitational collapse, is that a thermodynamic process? No, that's far out of equilibrium, right? In gravitational collapse, you're starting with a star that already has angular momentum, and you're allowing that star to run out of nuclear fuel and collapse, and the end object will have angular momentum because of that. You're not starting with a, a 
thermal ensemble. So uh, that shifts the question to a new question, and that's the one I want to address next, which is, is there any context in which we might think that black holes could be formed according to a microcanonical ensemble? And if so, uh, where should we be looking for those? Um, okay, I'm going to say a couple more things and then I'll pause for questions. I see there's already one in the, in the chat. So uh, one thing I want to, I, I want to make an analogy for you so that you can kind of start to see where I'm coming from. Uh, and the analogy is with inflation, uh, which you'll recall gives a really intriguing uh, explanation of the cosmic microwave background. So the when we look at the CMB, it's a per, almost a perfect black body spectrum. If you've never seen that experimental curve, you should look it up. It's absolutely gorgeous black body. But we also see some deviations from black body. And uh, what inflation tries to do is explain the origin of those deviations. And you could come up with an alternative explanation different from inflation. You could say, well, those fluctuations, they're due to thermal fluctuations in the early universe. The early universe was a hot primordial soup. That primordial soup was probably at roughly the same temperature, but there will be fluctuations. And then uh, the universe expanded and we should be seeing thermal fluctuations on that background of a CMB, uh, of a black body CMB. Um, but if you do the calculation, you'll find that the thermal fluctuations are just too small. They don't explain the magnitude of the observed fluctuations in the CMB. And so that's where inflation comes in, and it has a really interesting explanation. It says that these uh, anisotropies are well described by the statistics of quantum curvature perturbations. So we can take our quantum state of the early universe to be um, to be uh, a nearly Gaussian state, but with quantum perturbations. And if you follow that through, that's the whole business of um, tracking these uh, primordial curvature perturbations. And you know the scale free uh, density fluctuation spectrum. What you get is a quantitatively correct explanation for these temperature anisotropies. So this is a huge success of inflation. And uh, so this is the kind of setting that I want to bring into the discussion of black holes. In particular, uh, when I talk about the microcanonical ensemble, let's try and make it a little bit more concrete what kind of gravitational statistical mechanics I'm trying to imagine. So I'm trying to imagine uh, a Boltzmann probability distribution. And what do I mean by that? I mean, what are the probability of different metrics? Okay, but I'm not gonna just allow any old metrics. I'm gonna allow metrics that have a fixed mass energy in the region that I'm thinking of, okay? So how would you describe that kind of thing? Well, you need to be sure to take the dynamics of the theory into account. So capital G mu nu here is the Einstein tensor. So we put a delta function that puts us on solutions of the gravitational field equations. So that's the function of this first delta function. The second delta function takes the Hamiltonian constraint, the scalar constraint that we talked about earlier in the course, and requires that you fix that at a given mass energy. So these, this is the probability distribution we're talking about. And what do you normalize this by? Well, the path integral over all metrics that satisfy this constraint. Am I telling you I know how to carry out everything here? Ooh, in general, no, <laughs> absolutely not. I wish. That would mean we really had a lot of control over a quantum gravity theory. However, in the special case of uh, black holes, there's a nice uh, bit of control we have here. We can look at this in the sort of regime of the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, and you actually can carry out this kind of a calculation. Before I tell you, well, in fact, I probably won't tell you more about that right now. If you want to look at the details of how we did that, it's in the papers. But I want to tell you more about the conceptual interpretation that we're taking here. So the, the interpretation is that a quantum state for the geometry of the universe would lead to a probability associated with that state. It would be the probability of a metric geometry. 
And uh, in the full quantum theory of gravity, we wouldn't put the delta function on the solution of the Einstein equations. We would put the probability associated with these different wave functions. That's how you would do this. But what I, I want you to notice is that if your quantum theory of gravity satisfied the additional constraint that this wave function was sufficiently constant over this mass shell, so it was just one number over the mass shell, you would recover the Boltzmann distribution. And so this is actually a, a window from general relativistic stat mech, which we don't have full control over, but which we can make an assumption about. We can assume that the wave function is constant on the mass shell. And if we make that assumption, we recover all these results I just told you, right? All of these results, we're just making the microcanonical assumption on the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. And so we would expect this kind of thing. Expect it where? Expect it for way, uh, quantum gravity theories that satisfied this idea. So in particular, if black holes could be formed in the early universe, when we were, you know, expanding away, much like we are in an inflationary scenario, expanding away from this cosmic primordial soup, then perhaps we actually have an avenue for making black holes according to this microcanonical ensemble. Okay, so that's the theoretical bit of what I have to say. I'll leave this slide up. I'll take some questions. I'm going to, if you're skeptical, you're right to be skeptical, <laughs> but the, this theoretical setting, it, it was constructed as a, an attempt to look at experiments, uh, the, the data coming out of LIGO, and what I'll spend the next part of the, the discussion on is looking at that LIGO data and comparing it to the predictions of this ensemble. Okay, so that's where we're going, but let me field questions. So there are a couple already in the chat. Uh, uh, somebody mentioned the charge early on. Uh, of course, yes, we should, we should be thinking about charge as well. Uh, so Faikal also asks, uh, is the Gibbs-Boltzmann statistics, uh, sorry, Gibbs-Boltzmann statistics supposes extensivity and locality. Should we look for non-Boltzmannian statistics to encode the different nature of black holes? Faikal, like, oh, I, I absolutely agree. I am not constructing a full theory of general rel relativistic statistical mechanics. Um, it's one of my passions to try and think about that. I think we've thought about even special relativistic thermodynamics far less than we should. Some of the greats have spent a lot of time on it. Right when uh, special relativity came about, Planck and Einstein have a whole series of letters that are really fascinating. Um, uh, there's some beautiful work uh, by Lorenzo. Uh, Lorenzo's last name is escaping me. I'll remember it. Oh, Gavacino, Lorenzo Gavacino. He has some beautiful papers that I highly recommend you check out. But this is an area that needs more work. Carlo Rovelli's tried to work a lot on general relativistic stat mech. Um, but I'm at the moment not trying to tra take on that full theoretical project. I think it's a fascinating project. But, uh, but I want to see if there's a consistent regime in which that general theory reduces to something like Boltzmann-Gibbs statistics, uh, reduces to the microcanonical ensemble. So what am I doing? What's my logical setting? I'm assuming it works. <laughs> I'm looking at what the consequences of that working are, and I'm going to look for whether those are in experiments. But, uh, but yes, we should do much, much more in this arena, and I think it's really interesting. Uh, Deepan asks, uh, could the gravitational field cause some form of Berry curvature in the local phase of gauge particles, and could an Aronov-Bohm type of experiment be used to test quantum gravity? Um, yes, uh, this is a, a great deal of interest. Uh, so I mentioned the gravitationally induced entanglement, but um, there are modifications of that scenario. Um, uh, Carlo worked on them, uh, Marius Christodoulou, uh, several collaborators, Andrea Di Biagio. Um, 
one of the things that we're quite, we, I mentioned a lot already, the fact that uh, loop quantum gravity predicts uh, spectral discreteness in geometrical quantities. But a totally immediate obvious question is, does it uh, also predict spectral discreteness in measurements of time? And uh, it's ideas that are very closely related to your question that they proposed as a way, it's sort of a combination of your question and the gravitationally induced entanglement set up that I described at the beginning that they used to uh, propose an experiment that would probe the discreteness of time. Um, the, unfortunately, the time checking the discreteness of time requires even more precision than just the entanglement checks. So this is even a little bit further out. But for example, if the entanglement checks are achieved, we'll start immediately asking, OK, can you do the time one? <laughs> Uh, so I think this is a really interesting avenue. I think we we could all push on this a little bit more and see if there's uh, more to some of the proposals. All right, those are the questions that are already in the chat, uh, but I think in this format we can also unmute if anyone else has a question. I have a question, Hal. Yeah. yeah so so uh, uh, this this condition that you just mentioned that the probability uh, density is constant along uh, the match shell. Yeah, yeah. How, how could I interpret this? I I, I don't know. Um, it's a, it's a conjecture. It's not um, it's not something that we're deducing. That's what I was uh, trying to say a moment ago. So the, the observation is just the comparison that this is what the Boltzmann statistics would be, right? Mm -hmm. And then this is what a quantum gravity of theory, uh, quantum gravity theory should look like as a prediction, uh, right? This is a conditional probability. We're asking for what's the probability of a metric under these conditions? Well, if it's like any other quantum theory we know, conditional probabilities are given by putting in these delta functions. So, so far that's okay. the only input, but okay. So once we see this structure, we see that all we need for it to reduce to this previous slide is that this be essentially constant on the mass shell. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the input is kind of coming the other way around. It's coming from, if this were true, we would recover a standard setup that we understand well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not crazy to imagine that this could be true if somehow the, the probability gets, um, in a path integral sort of way, if the probability gets concentrated on a dominant classical solution, then you might expect that that probability would be nearly constant on that solution, right, on that mass shell. So I think it's quite reasonable. I'm not trying to say I think it's out of the blue. Uh, it's just that um, that I don't have the, the quantum theory of gravity that would predict this. <laughs> I, I only have the proposal. Yeah, yeah, but I mean that this would be what would happen for, I don't know, for any other quantum field theory, right? Yes, this is mm -hmm. a, I'm trying to, at the moment to, to only speak about things that are kind of robust to your approach. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a claim uh, that's specific to loop gravity or string theory or anything else. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and another question appeared in the chat. Faikal wonders, is this condition of con uh, constancy related to equiprobability of microstates at equilibrium? Yes. Uh, that's essentially what I'm trying to build. I'm trying to make sure that, that that's what comes out of this uh, probability distribution. And Mateus asks, doesn't this probability problem also resemble the problem of knowing the microstates of a black hole? Um, yes, although here I'm not trying to uh, identify specifically which microstates we, they are. At the moment, I'm just counting them. And so I'm trying to make a... Uh, a prediction about quantum gravity theories, regardless of your favorite characterization of those microstates. So if they're stringy or loopy or something else, uh, causal dynamical triangulations, 
Um, so far, all of those theories predict Bekenstein Hawking type behavior. And, uh, and this would be encompassed in all of them as far as I know. All right, let's continue from there. So uh, like I did a little bit with the LSC data and the masses, I'd like to kind of situate you as to what we know about black hole spins before LIGO, because I think that situation helps you to understand what's interesting about the LIGO data. So uh, what are the spins of black holes that are formed via standard collapse? We don't have a huge data set. You saw already that the electromagnetic black holes that we probed before LIGO was a small number. And then you have to meet even more stringent conditions in order to be able to bound the spin very accurately. Um, but this table summarizes what we knew. At the top, I'm just repeating the definition of the the Kerr parameter so that you have it in mind. Uh, in the table, a star is the, also the Kerr parameter. It's just a different way of notating it. And we have Cygnus X1 and various uh, electromagnetic black holes. And uh, you can see the spins vary quite a bit within this data set, all the way from uh, very small values like 0.12, well, with big error bars, but uh, all the way up to Cygnus X1, which actually has quite a large Kerr parameter, greater than 0.95. Um, and this is for these black holes that are in this tens of solar masses regime that we were talking about. Okay, so uh, black holes that form via collapse, they tend to have spin. That spin can be small, but it's typically fairly significant. So this whole theoretical argument I, gave, I just gave you is leading me to ask the question, is it possible that some black holes are born without any spin? Um, is zero spin evidence for the statistical nature of black hole entropy? That's that we, we know the Bekenstein Hawking entropy from a lot of directions theoretically, and it's very robust to the theoretical approach, but we have no empirical evidence for it yet. And uh, what comes from confronting these ideas with, with gravitational wave data. That's what I want to tell you about next. Okay, so um, I want to show you some LIGO data and some simulations that we did, uh, but it's helpful to kind of orient you to the parameters that are used in, the, in the, these data. So let's characterize a black hole system uh, by uh, black hole binary, we usually call it. So two black holes, each one has its own mass, and I'll call the spin of the black hole A, and uh, the second one has mass and spin, and the two black holes are orbiting one another, and from that orbit you also have the orbital angular momentum of the system. And when they merge, well, they result in a final black hole with the mass final. Uh, it has its own spin, and in the process, a lot of gravitational waves are emitted. So this is the characterization of those uh, black hole events. And I just keep keeping the Kerr parameter around because I don't want to assume anybody remembers it well. <laughs> uh, and then at the bottom, uh, so on the parameter space we're going to look at is going to have the, ma uh, the spin of the merged black hole, the final black hole, on the vertical axis, the y-axis. But uh, I'm also going to use this parameter that they use quite a lot in LIGO, uh, which is called chi effective. And it's called the effective initial spin. And it's a combination of a, a bunch of data. And that's why I need to tell you what it is. So it's a mass weighted average of the spins of the two black holes. So you see there's the mass weighting times spin, mass weighting times spin. But then to get a scalar, what they do is they project it onto the direction of the orbital angular momentum. Um, so why introduce this funny uh, parameter? Well, it turns out it's easy. It's amongst the easiest things to extract from the actual data that they obtain. So this is, you would love to be able to extract the individual spins of each of the black holes, but that's hard to do uh, as a data analysis problem. And this parameter, this combination, is much easier. And so this is the main thing that's been reported in many papers up to now. Um, I want to point out a few things about this quantity. 
uh, it ranges from negative one to one. So it's, uh, it's kind of like the Kerr parameter, except that it has some directional input. Uh, if this parameter were zero here, what would that mean? Well, there's a couple ways it could happen. If uh, the masses say were close to equal, and the directions of A1 and A2 were opposite each other, so the spin directions were opposite each other, then uh, this quantity would be zero. So there would just be the vectorial cancellation. Or another way it could be zero is if for some reason, each of these spins, they wouldn't have to be opposite each other, but if for some reason they were both in the orbital plane, so that L is pointing perpendicular to the orbital plane, and when you form the projection, the dot product, the, then you get zero. So those are some of the ways that uh, this quantity could be zero. And you'll see why I'm explaining that in just a moment. Um, so this is the parameter space that we're going to report things in. Um, OK, so the first thing I want to show you is some of the LIGO data. So these are the first events, the events that happened in 2015. Uh, you can read off when they were from the, the gravitational wave uh, label that people use. 1509.14 is 2015, September 14th. Um, so these three events, uh, oh, I don't have the masses here. I should have showed you. The masses were unexpected, as we saw already in that first slide. Uh, they were larger than black holes that we'd seen electromagnetically. Um, they, each of the mergers uh, ends up with a spin that actually was uh, well predicted by uh, theory, and it's in this range from 0.6 to 0.8, so that looks very reasonable. And uh, each of them has a chi effective that's close to zero. Uh, this one's a little bit larger. These two are closer to zero. So now you see why I was explaining zero. Zero is kind of going to be interesting in terms of the data. OK, here's all the way up through 2017. So now we're up to 10 events, and, and you get to see how the events are clustered. So the comparison I'd like to make is between these LIGO data and the data, uh, sorry, the theory that would be predicted, what events you would predict from that microcanonical ensemble that I just explained to you. So uh, here's a numerical simulation using uh, numerical GR. And uh, this is a simulation for a system that has two black holes in it, a binary that has equal mass. That's why I've drawn the black dots uh, equally large. And where each of them, the input black holes, has exactly zero spin. Because they each have exactly zero spin, chi effective is zero. And uh, when you merge these, you, this is the point you would predict. Uh, you can do this one actually almost pencil and paper, not quite, but almost pencil and paper. And you predict a final spin of 0.69 and a chi effective of exactly zero. OK, but what we want to do is uh, do numerical simulations for lots of different kinds of uh, mergers. So uh, here's another kind. Uh, where you would take one black hole large and the other black hole small, but you still take them both to have zero spin. Because they both have zero spin, they're still on this line chi effective equals zero. So the mass ratio, people call it, the mass ratio has the effect of suppressing the final spin of the merged black hole. Uh, so that's, that's what you're seeing in this gradient. As we go down to larger mass ratios, we get lower final spin. All right, here's what you get from, uh, so why am I drawing these particular dots? These are what you would predict from microcanonical ensemble. Remember we said as soon as you were talking macroscopic masses in the microcanonical ensemble, you would predict that the black holes had exactly zero spin. So that's why the red dots, the first ones I drew here, are all for zero spin. The blue dots are if you imagined that you merged a zero spin black hole with another black hole that has a uh, spin. And so you, when you do that in numerical GR, you get these blue dots. The darker dots have mass ratio closer to 1, and the lighter dots, you have mass ratio that's non-1. So you can see the lighter dots sort of tend to move towards the lower right quadrant of the plot, and the darker dots tend to cluster along this, this rim here. 
So why the funny notation up here? What we're imagining is a scenario where black holes are formed in the early universe, according to the microcanonical ensemble. The, we're going to call them first generation if they were just born in the early universe. So the red dots are what you would call a first generation, first generation merger. That is two black holes that were born in the early universe because they were primordial and microcanonical in our picture, they have zero spin, and so they form one of the red dots. If then after that happens, well, we know that after a red dot appears, it has spin. So we call the blue dots first generation, second generation mergers, because we're imagining that a primordial black hole with zero spin is merging with one that already had a merger and hence a spin. And so that's where the blue dots come from. So this is showing you a prediction of the theory that uh, I just described for you. So let's compare this prediction with the experiment. So here are the first five uh, LIGO events. And then uh, here's the, the 10 I showed you. Uh, don't get too excited. Uh, 10 data points on something like this, uh, it's not, don't, don't overread the plot. But I do want you to see that it's not, we're not talking something totally absurd here. Uh, it's an interesting idea. We have to build up a, a much bigger statistics to see whether there's something interesting here. Um, okay, this is just one model. I'm proposing this model where black holes are born with zero spin and then we watch them merge and what happens from there. Uh, what, what would other models predict? Um, oh, sorry, I gave you one more slide that includes the 2019 uh, data set. Uh, here I've included uh, more data points, and you can see I've included more extreme mass ratios. Why did I include more extreme mass ratios? Well, LIGO measured a black hole with a huge mass ratio. <laughs> I'll show you the data for the masses in just a moment, uh, but this one I find quite interesting because of where it fell. <laughs> um, all right, so those are the 2019 data. So the huge mass ratio one is up here. It's the one that's highlighted in this plot. Um, oh no, sorry, that's not the huge mass ratio. This was just the one that predicts, produced the largest mass. Uh, I'm not sure where the huge mass ratio one is. Anyway, uh, so this is the, the 2019 data. Okay. This is what I wanted to explain to you next, which is just whether there are alternative models of the LIGO data that are, are doing well. So um, there's two uh, models in the literature that, um, that appear most often. Uh, one of those is the idea that black holes uh, could form in globular clusters. A globular cluster is a huge collection of stars and uh, near the center of the cluster, you can have quite dense regions, and uh, you can imagine that you know maybe uh, gravitational collapse would result in black holes that have basically isotropically directed spins. So the that that's why the name isotropic comes about. So the the stars in there are wildly rotating and wildly orbiting each other, and so as you accrete mass, you might accrue uh, a spin direction that's really randomly oriented. So this is one of the models of astrophysics uh, of black holes, and the purple dots are the numerical simulation of uh, numerical GR simulation of isotropic black holes. So black holes that have spins pointed in random directions. And again, uh, with varying mass ratios, which are in the shading, but that's hard to see. And you can see that the isotropic population tends to cluster uh, in this purple cloud. Um, another scenario that people talk about is what's called a common envelope formula, uh, formation of black holes. So you imagine a big uh, disk of gas, and in that disk, uh, everything is co-rotating together. And if you had a gravitational collapse within that co-rotating disk, you could form black holes 
but those black holes would tend to have their spins aligned with the spin direction of all the mass. So orbital angular momentum and spin directions would all be aligned. So the orange dots are the GR numerics for these aligned populations or common envelope populations. And you get this orange cloud. And so, uh, so this started to get us more excited about this idea. You can see that the common envelope formulation is so far uh, not favored at all by the uh, LSC population. The isotropic, well, it's not doing bad or good. The statistics, again, needs to be much better to start to distinguish these things. But for example, that large mass ratio one, it seems uh, a bit surprising from the isotropic standpoint. OK, so uh, this is sort of where things stand. Um, I wanted to sort of mention something that's been around in the literature, but I'm not sure how seriously it was taken until LIGO started to measure these things. So um, I was saying that what we're talking about is primordial black holes, right? That's how you might get a population that is formed according to a microcanonical distribution. And uh, well, how do you form primordial black holes? And the idea is that uh, in the universe, you have this primordial soup. And we know that, for example, CMB perturbations are temperature fluctuations within that soup. But those tend to be quite small fluctuations, right? Fluctuations in energy in, in the soup. And to form a black hole, well, you need an overdensity of mass. And this would have to be quite a significant perturbation. It would be a large perturbation. Um, and you might at first say, well, are those even possible? And if you take a Gaussian statistics, they're extremely rare. But part of the point here is that it's not at all clear that for um, large perturbations, we should continue to use the Gaussian approximation. The Gaussian approximation is the approximation around zero. And we know from stock markets and other things, you may have heard this called the black swan event, you know, uh, the tails of a distribution don't tend to be Gaussian, even if the center is Gaussian. So the idea is that you would be considering large perturbations in density in the early universe. And then furthermore, if there is a phase transition in the early universe, uh, the pressure tends to drop during phase transitions. So for example, in the QCD transition, uh, there are lattice gauge theory computations that show this pressure drop, this uh, weakening in the equation of state uh, during the transition. So that pressure drop exponentially enhances the formation of black holes, uh, of black hole collapse uh, when you have an overdense region. So first you need the overdense region, but if you also reduce the pressure, then you're much more likely to collapse. So this is the kind of picture that we have in mind. And there's this beautiful calculation that was, as I say, around. People knew this uh, before LIGO, but I don't think it was taken too seriously. So uh, you could ask, what mass scale would a black hole have if it were formed during the QCD transition? And uh, the idea is to, uh, to look at the density, the energy density during the QCD uh, transition, uh, mass density, excuse me, well, same thing, um, and uh, look at the region that that density would have to be contained within to cause collapse and figure out the mass from that combination. So you just extract M0 from this data and then put in the QCD numbers. And lo and behold, what scale do you get out? 25 solar masses. Now, you shouldn't believe this up to factors of two or 10, like this is a total estimate, but it's a remarkable estimate that is coming out, you know, smack dab in the middle of where the LIGO data is finding black holes. Uh, so more careful calculations, again, using lattice gauge theory uh, calculations, find a sort of mass range, a mass window of anywhere between 0.1 and 100 solar masses. So this really does cover a lot of the data, uh, the window of data that LIGO is seeing. All right. 
Um, this is uh, some more recent papers looking at, at the question of whether the LIGO data is consistent with a uh, population of small spin. Um, here we get into the weeds a little. I'll leave it in, in the talk slides so you can look at the details here if you want, but I'm, I'm not going to go into this right now. I have too many other things I want to tell you. This is the LIGO data set at the end of 03, the third run. They had seen 83 binary black holes, seven neutron star or neutron star black hole mergers. It's hard to tell which sometimes. So these ones that you see that are half orange, half blue, that's the ambiguity. They're not sure whether it's a, a black hole or a neutron star that's merging. And, uh, and the mass, uh, masses that they hit. Um, so I think now it's easier to see that extreme mass ratio event is probably this event right here. Um, so, uh, and at any rate, this is an incredible slide to look at and, and you should stare at it some and see what you think of it. And so here's the comparison of uh, our prediction with the full uh, LIGO data set as it stood at the end of 03. Uh, the black lines are the error bars that the LIGO collaboration uh, reports. And so I still think it's quite interesting to compare these two populations. It, it, it really is indicating that zero spin is somehow playing a role in LIGO data. Whether our explanation is the correct explanation or there's another explanation, I think it's, it's good to know that and to be thinking about it as quantum gravity people. Of course, I never would want to claim that uh, all black hole mergers that we're seeing are a consequence of this mechanism that I've been describing today. Uh, we would at most expect a subpopulation of the black holes to be primordial, and it would be those that subpopulation that our idea would apply to. So for example, I'm happy to see that the LIGO data includes these two points up here, which from the perspective of our prediction would be outliers, but that just could mean that they have a different uh, mechanism altogether. Okay, so um, again, here's the comparison between the, this microcanonical ensemble that I've been discussing and the isotropic ensemble, and the isotropic ensemble also does quite well. So it's going to be a difficult uh, sort of statistical population analysis that sorts these out. Um, we do have some indications in our paper about how you would go about that analysis and doing it on numerical data sets where we know how much isotropic we mixed in with how much primordial. We were able to statistically say that you could pull these two populations apart. Um, LIGO data isn't there yet, but oh, uh, run four begins quite soon. So this is something that I'm I'm going to keep following and, and tracking what's going on with the LIGO data. OK, so what was the point of all of this discussion? For me, the point is that the, the major challenge in quantum gravity is to connect with experiment. And I want you all to come up with creative ideas for it. <laughs> that challenge is super interesting, super rich, uh, and, and we're still very much in a place where we need new ideas. So I pre presented this idea of, um, can we further correlate you know, mass and spin? Can we think about this in an even richer way than what I've told you about uh, to pin down a population of massive primordial black holes? That would be fascinating, fascinating result. Uh, there are other ways to leverage the advent of gravity waves to investigate quantum gravity. Uh, the nice idea by Parikh and Wilczek and Zahar Riyad uh, that appeared in PRL just a little while ago. Um, the, I also mentioned to you briefly this gravity-mediated entanglement. This is a huge area that people are publishing papers in daily, basically, and, and will be very interesting if it comes on board. Uh, there are beautiful works in cosmology. These have been covered much more elsewhere, and so I thought uh, I wouldn't go in more in depth in them, but um, the, the CMB has unexpected power 
in the, the large separations uh, in the sky. And, uh, and so cosmologists are looking to see whether a quantum theory of gravity could explain that. So this is something that you should definitely look into as well. But we need more of these avenues. We need one of them to be successful. Uh, we said at the first discussion that one of the reasons quantum gravity is hard is that we don't have enough empirical input. Uh, and people are really actively trying, and I'm more optimistic than I ever have been, but, but we should be working on this quite actively. Okay, so for the last 10 minutes of the talk, and it really will only be 10 minutes, I'm just going to go over a couple of ideas and challenges uh, to all of you, and then we'll, we'll have time for the last question session. So uh, matter and lambda. We, we touched on this very briefly, but uh, there's a lot of exciting things that are happening with matter. People have worked on trying to include fermions in a spin foam model in uh, thinking about the, the so-called fermion doubling problem, which shows up quite uh, generically in lattice approaches to, to gauge theories. Um, and people have exciting ideas about addressing some of these issues. But I don't think we're there yet with matter. There's a lot more that needs to be done. And I mean, I can just give you an immediate example that's so closely tied to the discussions we've had throughout the school, which is that we looked at the static weak field limit of, of Newtonian gravity. And we noticed already that in that limit, you had a gravitational Gauss law. And I talked a lot with you about the case where the region was empty of mass. And in that region, we obtained our tetrahedron and the other polyhedral approximations. And we understood that, that that's a beautiful gauge theory in itself to think about. But I neglected the whole time mass. And there's just no reason to do that. Even in this limit, you would have a mass. And that mass does something really interesting. It brings in one of the sort of non localities of gravity, which is that you can communicate the presence of that mass out to the boundary. And so I don't, I'm not satisfied with my own understanding of where this shows up in the spin network formalism. How do we encode this? It should be maybe in the intertwiner, but, but I want a rich uh, explanation of how, how this shows up in, in that setting. Um, so that's, that's a, a question or a challenge I would pose to all of you. It, it seems like it's something we should be able to do maybe not in the full theory yet, but at least in the sort of static weak field limit, this is something that we should attack. In other words, what's a massive cat? <laughs> so here's Jimmy again. This was just yesterday. I couldn't believe this. He was like sliding off the chair. But at any rate, like we, we should be able to figure out the, the nice description of a massive cat. All right. Um, Thinking about mass in this way is one inroad there to a beautiful set of works that is happening uh, all over the world uh, where people are thinking about what we call corner symmetries and edge modes and, and soft theorems. So this is a place where there's a lot of overlap between loop gravity and string theorists. Uh, Strominger is, was the pioneer in this soft theorem business. Um, and uh, the reason for that connection is that, um, that this non-locality that I was just mentioning, the, the presence of mass sort of communicates the presence of uh, the mass that's in the interior out to the, the boundary of your region. And uh, edge modes and corner symmetries are about really trying to understand the theory from the presence of the boundary. And what is it that we can say there and what, what can we not say there? Um, most often people study this from asymptotic boundaries, boundaries out at infinity, but uh, what we'd really like to do is to study this in finite regions and, and be able to pin down everything about the, the theory in the finite region. It's a much harder problem. Uh, another thing that I think, which was mentioned in the questions already, uh, is that there's this beautiful thing that we understand well in gauge theories, um, although we don't always give it a name, and I wanted to name it, it's sometimes named in the literature, but kind of rarely, I wanted to name it for you so you could think about it more. We saw that gauge theories are subject to gauge transformations. 
and that those gauge transformations, uh, well, they're kind of the key feature of the redundancy of the gauge theory. But um, another thing that they lead to is, uh, is the change in wave functions. So in electromagnetism, when you make a local gauge transformation, that shows up as a phase in the wave function. And uh, it's a big part of the quantization of the theory to understand uh, how to deal with this change in phase. And it leads, as you, you all were mentioning, to Aronov-Bohm type things. So this uh, principle is general. That is, there's a co-rotation. When you make a gauge transformation, it also shows up in wave functions. And so this is maybe another mathematical avenue for pinning down what's going on with mass in spin networks. We need to have the right notion of co-rotation when you make a gauge transformation. And that notion of co-rotation probably should include the mass in the, in the phase, just as the charge is included in the electromagnetic case. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the reference here. I'll, I'll maybe add it after today's discussion. There's a beautiful set of papers by um, Wikrama Sekera. It's kind of a hard name for Westerners, but uh, uh, Klink and Wikrama Sekera. Um, and one of them, what they were trying to do was to generalize the Bargman picture of particles in quantum field theory. Bargman understood particles as representations of symmetries in the theory of Poincaré. And Wikrama Sekera and, and Klink are looking at, um, at symmetry transformations where you allow the change to non-inertial frames. And this leads to a generalization of a group called a loop. And I think that this co-rotation principle and their work on loops could be a really interesting avenue to sort of generalizing spin, uh, spin networks in a, in a nice way. So that's a big uh, open area. It's a little mathematical, but I think there's really lots of physics that you could extract from it if you attacked that area. Um, an area that I've worked on a, a bit and I find really beautiful and interesting uh, is the area of curved or constant curved tetrahedra. So you could imagine a tetrahedron where instead of having flat faces, each one of its faces was a portion of a sphere, uh, and a constant curvature sphere. And going from one to the next, maybe you have different spherical sections, but each one of these is completely uh, geodesic. Uh, and when you build a uh, tetrahedra in this way, you get a beautiful generalization of the gauge theory that we discussed, our tetrahedral cat. Instead of having the, the Lie algebra elements sum up to zero, what you get in this case is that the Lie group elements associated with each face of this tetrahedron, their product is the identity. And, um, and these Lie group elements have a beautiful interpretation. This was totally missed in the mathematical literature. Uh, it was quantum gravity folks, uh, my, my collaborators, Mushin Han and Aldo Riello and Wojciech Kaminski. It was us that pulled out the fact that the, these group elements can be interpreted as parallel transports around the face of the tetrahedron. And as such, they encode the area exponentially with the Lie algebra generators. So this is a beautiful generalization of a, of a gauge theory. Uh, it turns out the mathematicians had worked out part of this story in the theory of Poisson Lie groups. And this leads into a huge mathematical literature that's really rich and, and gorgeous, and finally arrives at the theory of quantum groups and Q deformations. So um, these constant curvature environments are a way to think about the cosmological constant. And there's a lot that can be done here, and a lot that I think would be really interesting. In other words, what's a spherical cat? Yeah, we talk too much about spherical cows. We need a spherical cat. We need a good understanding of the gauge theory behind these constant curvature tetrahedra. So that would be a, a massive achievement, I think. All right. And the last set of questions I, I want to 
opposed to you come from this analogy I was mentioning at the beginning with the non-constant number of particles in a quantum field theory. What's the analog of that in a quantum theory of gravity? And um, I think there's at least two ways to think about this. Uh, and one is what I see as perhaps the most uh, insidious persistent problem in papers on quantum gravity and that I want to caution you all as uh, people who are starting to work in this field and, and starting to do really good research, I want to caution you against making this mistake. In quantum mechanics, we are extremely used to doing what we call the subsystem split, taking our Hilbert space and saying that we can break it up into a tensor product of one Hilbert space with another. Gravity, as we know, is universal and uh, frequently causes this to just fail. You cannot make the subsystem split in the presence of gravity unless you take the gravitational interactions into account. This leads to confusion all over the place, confusion about entanglement because you assume you could make the split when you couldn't, confusion about what you're talking about when you're talking about a subsystem, you're trying to overly isolate a subsystem that you can't isolate. So uh, be careful of making the subsystem split. Whenever you write this kind of thing down and you're happy, oh, I derived something, check, was it true? <laughs> um, I think that this is uh, you know, a, a symptom of a, a lot of the things we've talked about. We need to take into account the gravitational Gauss law, the diffeomorphism constraints. We need to be very careful when we make this split. I'm not saying that it's impossible. I'm not saying that there's no regime in which this is possible. I'm just saying that you need to be aware of it and, and check whether you're in that regime or not. So uh, Laurent Friedel and William Donnelly have worked on this. Uh, Arigi and others um, have tried to generalize the notion of tensor products so that it would be valid in these systems. Uh, Eugenio Bianchi, who I mentioned in the context of our gravitational black hole work, uh, has done some beautiful recent work where they uh, they take the constraint into account when they compute entanglement and entanglement entropy measures. And by doing that, you actually get perfectly meaningful and well-defined notions of entanglement. So it is possible, you just have to be careful when you do it. Okay, so understanding that more deeply, understanding the validity of when you can make subsystems and what the nature of those subsystems should be for it to be valid. That's something I wish we had a totally general theory that told us, okay, you're totally safe doing this. That would be ideal. So that's something that I would challenge you to work on. Um, so that's, uh, that's about breaking things up. I also wanna mention symmetry briefly. And here there's a beautiful old idea in the literature that I want to see a more concrete realization of. Um, when we uh, study spin angular momentum and spin systems, there's something that we take for granted that's actually quite beautiful. Um, you could worry, well, if I introduce discreteness into my quantum system, and then I act a symmetry transformation, how's that going to be consistent? That is, for example, say I have a spin a half particle, then I measure its angular momentum along the z direction. Well, I know I can only get plus or minus a half. So let's say I measure it to be plus a half, but now I rotate the system so that it's in the x direction. Uh, what's gonna happen? Now the discreteness is gonna be along another direction. How, how's that gonna be consistent with the discreteness along the initial direction? And there's this beautiful answer that quantum mechanics has in the case of the spin system, which is that the components of angular momentum don't commute. And so if I take my system and I expand it in an X basis, I get a superposition of states in the X basis. And that superposition is completely consistent with the initial Z measurement. So, um, the idea is that loop quantum gravity should behave the same way, that if I take a tetrahedron and I rotate it or I boost it, uh, that the discreteness that we saw in its spectral parameters should be consistent with that symmetry. And we've already seen that this is actually quite promising because how did we describe the areas? With angular momenta. 
and the angular momentum components don't commute. And so maybe exactly the same thing can be carried through for our tetrahedral grain. Um, my concern is that nobody's ever done it. Uh, this paper shows all the ideas. They show that the, the spatial slices don't com commute and that, that the idea should work, but nobody's actually taken a concrete model like the tetrahedron and performed rotations and boost and explicitly shown the way in which they decompose into, um, into superpositions of quantum states. Uh, in particular, the volume is not obvious to me at all that that's going to work out. I hope and think it should, but I'd like to see it concretely worked out. So I think this is a really interesting problem to attack. All right, so that's something you could build off of our cat very directly. This would be a gravitational cat. And finally, this field theory thing. So I'm delighted by the examples of work in Lorentzian Reggie calculus that are starting to come out, the area Reggie calculus that we just uh, talked about. Um, my this this was a, a focus, for example, at the the Loops conference that just happened. This I guess it's last year now. Sorry, um, but I'm still wanting to have a deeper understanding of causality and topology in these theories. And I told you one of the reasons this is hard, four-dimensional topologies are hard, but is there some way that we can organize our approach to Lorentzian signature, to causal structure, to topology changing space-times? So here's an example, you know, famous string theory example of the pair of pants. If I had a spatial region that was a circle, I evolved it in time, uh, and the two circles merged here at the, the crotch, you would have a topology change. We would go from uh, two distinct S1s to a single merged S1. Is that something that we should sum over in quantum gravity? The string theorists say definitely. Uh, and uh, I think there's a lot of interest in this. This should somehow be the, the, the Feynman diagram version of space-time physics. But how to control those sorts of sums is extremely wild. And uh, I think even toy examples that are worked out in detail would be really exam uh, really interesting and, and insightful in this context. This starts to get into a topic I've been working a lot in on in recent years, uh, which is the topic of tunneling of space-time geometries. And I think tunneling might be a way to think about this and might be a really interesting avenue. Um, this goes back a couple of weeks, so you may not remember that you had the question, but one of the audience members asked a nice question about whether tetrad and triad variables had an advantage over metric variables. And actually, in the context of space-time topology change, they very much do. Um, the tetrad can consistently vanish at a point, and if you have a point of topology change like this, a vanishing tetrad would make perfect sense. And so this actually um, further sort of motivates that use of variables in my mind is the fact that they allow for this greater generality where you can have a singular structure at points where topology change happens. Um, if you tried to do this with the metric, you would run into all sorts of problems. All right, those are my questions for you. I thank you all for a lovely, lovely couple of weeks and for all of your questions, and, and I'm interested in hearing some more. Thank you, Hal. Um, thank you very much for all these uh, great lectures, and um, especially for the time. So we have a few questions in the chat. Maybe you could look at them, and then we can close the session. Sounds good. So let's see. Let me see if I can get the most recent ones. Uh, okay, uh, Alicia is pointing out that if you're interested in the gravity mediated entanglement, uh, Flaminia's course talked about it, um, and yes, it's another one of the the lectures in the series that the International Society is putting together, the basics of quantum gravity, and uh, Flaminia's talks are fantastic, um, so do check those out. She's coming from uh, more of a quantum information perspective, and will give you much more depth on that side. 
Um, S. Kastrinakis is asking a question for the end. There was an observation of photon speed being the same for different frequencies in contrast to loop quantum gravity. How troubling should we consider this? Thank you. Um, good. So um, Lorentz invariants and, um, and these dispersion relations of photons were uh, were early proposals that were made uh, both in loop gravity and outside of loop gravity as possible phenomenological signatures of quantum gravity. So here the idea was that perhaps um, the discreteness of space-time actually changes the dispersion relation of the photon, and that if you had a photon that was traveling over interstellar distances, you know, over vast cosmological scales, that that change in the dispersion relation could be probed experimentally. Um, but be careful, this was just an idea as a consequence. You know, one of the other places it showed up was in this um, approach of introducing a, a length scale into any theory of quantum gravity. If you take seriously the Planck scale as the limiting scale of your theory, then uh, you, you're you going to want to do something like what Einstein did with velocity addition. So when you add two velocities in Galilean relativity, they just add up, right? But Einstein modified the velocity addition rule to preserve the speed of light so that no matter what the velocities you're adding, uh, you can never exceed the speed of light. And in particular, so that when you add the speed of light, you, you will always get the speed of light. Um, and so this was also done uh, as an approach uh, for thinking about length scales. If we want to make a fundamental length scale in our theory, maybe we have to modify how we think about uh, dispersion relations and length scales, modify in particular the group structure of how we add things in order uh, to preserve that scale. And uh, you're correct that so far nobody's seen any evidence of modified dispers dispersion relations in, uh, in experiments, but this isn't uh, either a fundamental input to any of our theories of quantum gravity. The, the spectral discreteness that I talked to you about throughout the course doesn't require that um, somehow your spacetime is literally broken up into chunks. Right? This is what we talked about when we talked about the interpolation of the degrees of freedom. So you don't have to modify a dispersion relation. It could be that it's a more subtle Lorentz covariance that's along the lines of what I was just discussing. When we rotate our states via a boost or a rotation, the state just changes into a superposition of states. And there's no, um, the signature of that spectral discreteness isn't writ on the dispersion relation of the, the photon. So this was a promising avenue. It, it hasn't worked out so far. It doesn't seem that that causes problems for any of the approaches to quantum gravity yet. But if you want to build in a theory that modifies dispersion relations, you have to worry about this. And you have to, that your theory has to respect the experimental bounds on, on that violation. Um, Karsten Dierks, who I can see, hello. Uh, also had a final question. Uh, how do photons or other particles propagate through space in loop gravity uh, from polyhedra to polyhedra? Will there be uh, differences between massive and non-massive particles? So yeah, as I was saying um, just now in the, the response to the last question, uh, I wanna again and again stress that you shouldn't take these polyhedra to say space-time is literally cut into polyhedra, right? The polyhedra are a model for the finite number of degrees of freedom that we're talking about when we cut the theory down to a finite number of degrees of freedom, right? My analogy from the last discussion was if you're, one of the ways we probe gravitational physics is if, with uh, test masses, right? So if you imagine a solid ball of test masses, then you can probe all of the degrees of freedom of the gravitational field, infinitely many, right? But if I take away most of those test masses and I just leave a few, I'm not probing all of the degrees of freedom of the gravitational field. I'm only probing a few. And that's what the polyhedral picture is doing. It's only keeping track of just a few of the degrees of freedom of the field. 
Does it mean the other degrees of freedom aren't there? No, it doesn't mean that. They're, they're potentially there and we have to study them. You know, we have to go to a finer graph and study those and a finer graph and study those. Um, and so it's more of a pragmatic move. It's that it's hard to study in, in a background independent theory like this, where we're not fixing some structure, it's very hard to study all of the degrees of freedom at once. What are you studying with respect to what, right? So the move that we make is to cut down the gravitational degrees of freedom to a few and study those. So um, to answer your question about photon and particle propagation, um, the I don't think there's been enough work that concretely addresses that question. That's part of what I was saying when I was saying we need to think more about mass in this in this theory. Um, but to give you a hint of how we would imagine it would go, as you study more of the degrees of freedom of the gravitational field, it would look more and more like classical propagation. That is, we would expect in the semi-classical regime of the theory to recover normal propagation. Um, but you're asking a, more, a refined question. You're saying, are there quantum gravitational effects that I should expect? And that's the question that I think needs more investigation. I don't, we don't, the, the thing that we have the most evidence for already in loop gravity is the graviton propagator which you can study in the semi-classical limit, and it looks to recover the sort of standard gravity and graviton propagator in the truncation to the finite number of degrees of freedom that we've looked at. Uh, so you, of course, the hard work would be to extend that to more degrees of freedom and understand if it's still true. And that gets into the hard work of renormalization and all these sorts of things, which are very much open questions and should have been on my list just now. Uh, renormalization is is a difficult area that's been worked on a lot and where there's still a lot to do. Uh, I'm scrolling back because there have been lots more questions. Let's see. Uh, Deepan is asking, is there a geometrical interpretation of loops and resolution of divergences in the spin foam model? Uh, yes, the loops have exactly the same interpretation as the one that we discussed in the canonical theory, which is that they are gauge invariant measures of the curvature of space-time. Um, in the spin foam model, we're doing exactly that same truncation of degrees of freedom that we were just discussing, and so they're uh, going to necessarily be truncated measures of the curvature. They're not going to be infinitely refined, but they're they're probing the parts of the curvature that you have access to in a gauge invariant way, and that's why I spent so much time discussing this cool thing that. Uh, Wilson loops are good observables in loop gravity because diffeomorphism makes it so that one loop, it's just a small deformation of another loop, are gauge equivalent. And so that actually makes it a much more useful observable than in a theory where you don't have diffeomorphisms because the two Wilson loops would just be distinguished and you would have uh, infinitely many observables that would be hard to sort out. Um, and then the, Deepan also gives a very nice thank you. You're very welcome and thank you. Uh, another question. Could the gravitational field cause some form of Berry curvature in the local phase of gauge particles? Uh, so this is sort of a, oh, I see, you're commenting on it. Oh, you were thanking me for that one. Perfect, we addressed that question earlier. Uh, Idris asks, some of the work, work in the loop community discusses black hole tunneling to white hole through effective dynamics of the reduced symmetry via Hamiltonian formulation. I have two questions regarding this. Well, first of all, Idris, thanks for asking about this. I was one of the people who started that work, and I, I'm slightly embarrassed I didn't include it today, but, uh, but uh, I do love it. <laughs> so. Uh, the first question is, does anyone have a similar effective evaluation from the Lagrangian covariant perspective, and do those approaches, are they consistent? So there's been a lot of work on both the canonical and the covariant side on this. Uh, so Carlo Rovelli and I, Francesca Vedotto, 
And um, many people since, many students worked with Carlo on uh, elaborating the idea. So uh, the initial paper we wrote was called Black Hole Fireworks, and you can look at that one. Um, it was the idea that um, there are regimes of the theory that we hadn't understood could be highly quantum mechanical. So I talked a lot to you about the single uh, central singularity of a black hole, the place where infinite density is predicted by the theory. And uh, we, we understood that, oh yeah, that is a place where quantum gravity effect should be happening. Um, but there's another regime, which is the, when we draw a black hole, we often draw the horizon extending all the way out to the sin central singularity. But that's actually a late time regime of the theory. And at late time, you can imagine quantum effects piling up. That you've allowed a long time for them accrue, to accrue, and that's where tunneling comes into the story. So Carlo and I thought about this initially largely from a covariant Lagrangian uh, perspective, uh, but uh, Abhay Ashtakar and Martin Bojewald started thinking about this very early on, and uh, they didn't uh, compare it with a white hole, but they, they said quantum gravity should resolve the evaporation of the black hole, and they gave a very compelling Penrose diagram for that. And then in recent years, Ashtakar and, and collaborators uh, uh, have worked on um, sort of this transition to a white hole and how to think about that from a canonical perspective. Uh, I can add some, some references to these works. Uh, the second question was, should we take such an effective description seriously since we uh, truncate infinitely many degrees of freedom? Um, part of the idea was that um, your logic should be the other way around. If you're going to draw a Penrose diagram, you have to indicate on the Penrose diagram what the limits of the validity of the diagram are. And we often fail to do that. And I think it's a big mistake. When you when you draw a Penrose diagram, you'll often people see people write the, the singularity as a squiggly line, central singularity. We should never draw that far down into the black hole. The curvature reaches Planckian scales well before you get to that wiggly line. And as such, we shouldn't trust the diagram at all. The diagram is a classical diagram. It's not at all obvious that we can even draw a single space time at that point. Quantum gravity effects are strong there. It could be a superposition. Does it even make sense to draw one space time? So, so you should, we should be more careful about excising regions of the uh, Penrose diagram that make no physical sense in the classical theory. Um, so I, I tried to explain this carefully, actually, in the New Journal of Physics paper that's cited in the talk earlier, where we talk about black hole spin. I tried to really give, uh, Eugenio Bianchi and I tried to really give some intuition for which regions of a Penrose diagram you should trust and which you shouldn't. And so if you want to look more into that, that, that would be a paper you could look at. All right. Of course, the questions will come in faster than I can answer them. I'll go on for maybe five or 10 more minutes. Is yeah, that good I, for you? I, I think that sounds good. And then maybe you can close the session. People who would like to stay can continue discussing. That sounds good. Uh, so uh, Faikal says, um, given that black holes cannot be in thermal equilibrium with their surroundings, what does loop gravity say about black hole stability? Uh, so I, I think Faikal's uh, referring to the Bekenstein, uh, sorry, to the Hawking radiation. So uh, even if a black hole were isolated, it would be radiating and hence not in thermal equilibrium. And uh, loop gravity takes that very seriously. <laughs> this is something that, while it's very difficult to empirically probe, makes us think that black holes do not live forever and makes us think that you should be taking quantum effects into account, especially towards the end of the black hole evaporation. So that's that's uh, very closely tied with this discussion of black hole to white hole transitions. And what we're asking is, what is the end of the life cycle of a black hole? And uh, we've sort of tried to spend a lot of effort. If you use the Hawking radiation to estimate the life, um, 
the lifetime of a black hole, you get this m cubed number. I think I wrote it down. It's something like 10 to the 75th seconds. So it's um, many, many orders of magnitude longer than the age of the universe. And uh, this is somehow implausible that black holes might live that long. And it, it, I think it indicates that there's um, back reaction effects that we're neglecting that we can't at the end of the, the lifetime. So today I spoke a lot about primordial black holes and about the possibility that LIGO black holes are primordial in nature. But uh, another smoking gun signal of primordial black holes would be if you found a very light black hole, say less than a solar mass or even a planetary mass black hole, then we would have to be primordial in nature. So, you know, ours using spin to extract whether it's primordial or not is difficult. Our proposal is difficult. You would have statistical claims you would need to make. Um, if you found a light black hole, I think nobody has any mechanism for making them except primordial. So, um, so that would be easy, <laughs> uh, but we would have to find one. Uh, so the, that would be very fascinating because of the question of stability that you're asking. A light black hole would have a much shorter lifetime because uh, as if you look at the Hawking temperature, it scales as one over the mass. And so they're much hotter, the lighter they are. And, uh, and you could both probe the Hawking radiation and probe lifetime ideas in that context. Who knows whether we'll ever see one, uh, but it would be totally fascinating. Um, Ahmed asks, uh, do infinities ever appear in the current formulation of loop gravity? Uh, no, as far as we can tell, the theory is finite. Um, you will see claims in the old literature about it being infrared divergent, not ultraviolet divergent. So it had the, the older literature concerned was concerned with the Planck scale being finite, but the, the long scale being infinite. Um, we, we don't, the theory is very much a work in progress in my way of thinking. And I, I want more control over the, the infrared, but we have models that include a cosmological constant and they, we can include a positive cosmological constant in the theory. So the work I mentioned with Mushin Han and Aldo Riello and, and Wojciech Kaminsky was, was including a positive cosmological constant. And um, when you do that, you have an, an infrared cutoff as well as an ultraviolet cutoff. And the theory appears to be completely finite. Um, so you know, you could ask me much more detailed questions than the question you asked, and I'm sure I would have to say we don't know the answer to that. But there's no indication of any infinity in the theory uh, as of yet. All right. Um, I think we can uh, close the session. Thanks, um, Hal, again. It was really a, a great pleasure to have you as a lecturer. I think I can add nothing to all the nice comments in the meeting chat. Um, so with that, um, yeah, maybe let me say that we will have a summer break now. So the basics of quantum gravity school will continue in September with different topics, different lectures. We will post more details on the website. And with that, um, thanks you, thank you all for joining. Enjoy your summer and um, see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Paul. This was very nice. Oh, I'm so glad. It was really a pleasure being